Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Javi. Um, I'm one of the founders of Tiny Bird. Uh, I'll explain a little bit later more about the company to give some context about the project. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the uh, a project that we developed uh, during the uh, month before the Black Friday for uh, for uh, one of uh, our clients. I'm going to go through all more or less all the important the the design decisions. Um, I hope you I hope you like it. Uh, to start with, to put some data into context, with, when I when I decided the title for this talk, I I, I wanted to put like a big number, like 12 trillion rows, which is quite a lot. Uh, just stop and think and think about that. Is it's a number that is kind of hard to imagine, but. If you put that in context of a regular machine today, a modest laptop, uh, I created in this case, I created in using ClickHouse. I will talk more about ClickHouse, which is uh, the, the database engine that we use in this case. But uh, I created a 100 million rows table. I query that table, and you, you can see I run a simple average. Um, it, it, it took uh, 200 more or less milliseconds to process that 100 million rows, which is, I mean, it's pretty fast. But machines today uh, are really, really fast. Uh, and I'm not using any specific hardware here. It's a regular uh, uh, CPU and that's it. So if you extrapolate that and you use, uh, and it, for example, in this laptop, you will process 12 trillion rows running this query during these six hours. So if you get many machines, bigger ones and so on, you will be able to query 12 trillion rows in a matter of minutes. So, uh, of course, I mean, there is, no sing there is no use case as simple as that, just one column running one average. But if you think about that, to put that in, cost in context, I think that's a pretty good ex exercise. Anyway. Let's go to the to the problem. So, to give some context, we uh, Tinybird is a, a, a SaaS product that build uh, real-time products that allow to work with a lot of data, a lot of data coming in and a lot of requests coming out. So. This is important for uh, for this project. I'm not going to talk more, more about the product. I'm going to explain the internals of the product. I'm going to, to talk about how we solve the problem, but I'm not going to talk about the product. I'm not the sales guy here. Uh, so, But I wanted to mention this because it, it gives you context about the, the whole thing. So we were working with, with a client um, since two years ago, more or less. Um, the client one month before Black Friday, they said, okay, guys, we have a project for you. Um, we want to run uh, real-time sales data during the Black Friday for different areas of the company. So we have a bunch of dashboards, uh, and we want you to create API endpoints to feed those dashboards. That's it. That's, that's the problem. Of course, the problem is like they have a quite a lot of traffic, quite a lot of, quite a lot of sales during that night, and there are like quite a lot of people uh, watching uh, those dashboards during that night. So at the beginning, if you don't have a product or you just start from scratch, you could go this way, which is kind of a standard. You have a Kafka, which scales pretty well. Then you can run any streaming engine technology KSQL or whatever, put the data in Redis or in other database uh, system, and then run an API reading data from Redis and exposing that data as a JSON or any other format. That's it. Pretty kind of easy. And you fit down those dashboards and that's it. The problem is like um, the dashboards were not so simple as big numbers or just uh, simple aggregation of data. It was more than that. Uh, all the dashboards have filters, uh, really specific things, 
time zones, configurations. So it was really easy to, it was really hard to uh, just get what uh, a couple of counters and solve the project. It required more, 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 more than that. So for example, let me explain you a little bit uh, the, the the project. Um, more details about the project. For example, the data, uh, the data source was a legacy transactional database. Uh, I'm not. When I say legacy, I don't want to be. I, I, I want. I don't want to blame anyone. I just want to say legacy because it has been working for years. And uh, actually, legacy is a. It's a word that I like. You know, it's like a legacy systems is what. Uh, pays uh, our salaries, so I'm uh, just giving context here, not not trying to blame or, or point anyone. Um, so we had no CDC change events or things like that. Um, during that night, we had more than 500 concurrent users. So it's not just three or four people making decisions and watching those dashboards. It's a lot of people. Uh, actually querying data or fetching data all the time. It has to be real time, no lag or no delayed since the sales wa the sale was actually made to uh, to be reported on the dashboard. Um, there were, as, as, as I said, mul multiple filters and, and options, not just global counters that you can store in Redis or something like that. You need you needed more um, query features than just getting basic analytics. Um, about the data stream, we have events with sales, rows, I mean, batches of rows with sales, two of columns, with things that you might expect uh, in a use case like this, like product, units, amount, things like that. I, I don't want to be really specific here. I don't want to expose too many details because I don't want to talk about uh, the the client. I just want to talk about the minimum amount of things that you need to know to understand the use case, uh, because uh, you know the, the the client of course doesn't want to us to talk about about it, and we wouldn't do it actually. So um, they have five different data sources. So they send each data source send uh, one batch per second with the last five minutes of data. So if a row, if a sale changes, for example, it's the state or the or the you know is can is cancelled or whatever happened with that um, cell, that change is sent to us in a batch every second, something like that. And you might guess that uh, there are a lot of changes during that night because people are buying like crazy and so on, and, and uh, of course. Everything. I mean, a lot of things are going on. Not just sales, but changing internal states and so on, which are really are relevant uh, for the dashboards. Not just I sold this product or I didn't sell this product or I sold uh, one unit or twelve units of, of that product in that country. So, um, and of course, a lot of re uh, uh, read uh, concurrency, a lot of clients requesting data, millions of rows per minute, as I said. And one important thing, which is as they are sending the data, all the rows that are changing during uh, during the last five minutes, of course, we have a lot of d duplicated rows. So they can be sending rows like uh, the same row like 60 times sometimes. So. Uh, and we need to duplicate rows in real time, which is not easy uh, for most of the databases up there. I mean, with for regular transactional databases like Postgres, MySQL, you can run upsets. For other uh, tra uh, analytics uh, database, it's not that easy, especially uh, especially at, at scale. So, ideally, ideally, uh, uh, we we said, okay, maybe that. This problem is much much easier uh, than we were thinking about. We could get like a data, expose an API, an API, they send the data to that API. We generate JSON files as the data comes in, and we expose that through Nginx. That's it. It could be a perfect solution because you know it scales pretty well. Uh, the, the 
there's not going to be problems with uh, scale or something goes down because you know static data is, is really solid <laughs> but the problem is like there there were too many filters or, or different combinations to generate all the possible combination uh, combinations or JSON files uh, that the data came in so we discarded that of, of course at the I mean, you know we thought about that we knew that that was not going to possible but it's important to think about every single possibility because I mean we don't want to run into a pretty um, complex project if, if you don't need to so we decided to use our product of course um, and to give you some context we are pretty boring we like to use pretty old technology nginx barnes python things like that um, it worked really great for us in previous companies so we decided to use that that technology uh, we actually didn't have time to make uh, complex decisions because we were in a hurry we we had just one month and the project was complex enough to don't spend time trying to try things try new things and so on um, and if we were using in this case we were using clickhouse in our product since uh, since uh, three years ago uh, and look like a pretty good fit so uh, and if you don't know clickhouse and you are working in this space with a lot of data and real-time queries and so on you should take a look and it's a database analytics the da analytical database it's a really a great piece of technology the, the first time actually the first time that I use clickhouse I I had been working with Postgres for eight years something like that so the first time I ran a query in clickhouse I thought okay this is I mean I made a mistake I, I this is a a mistake it can't be so fast but yeah it was it was so fast so that's the first thing that you think when you um, when you use clickhouse you think this is not possible it's not possible that this is so fast but anyway you didn't try it give it a try if, if, if you are trying to uh, solve a use case like that like, like, like the one that I, I am talking about so if you take a look at this diagram you, on the right you have the JSONs, the JSON file uh, solution which is really fast because it's static data but of course it doesn't have any flexibility you can query what you have in your JSON files that's, a, that's that on the other side you could store all the sales rows in a database and use SQL or any other uh, query technology or language to query that data of course it's really flexible but it's slow so in the middle there is something that clickhouse has a really nice features which is materialized views that allows you to incrementally generate views which is pretty important the, the incremental part is pretty important and you can leave the data in a state in between raw data and static data so you have enough flexibility to cover all the use cases so or more most of your use cases and the queries are fast not as fast as uh, static data but much much faster than uh, raw that querying raw data maybe one or two on, uh, orders of magnitude so we decided to go with materialized views uh, and then uh, of course I mean our product supports materialized views and so on so it was kind of an easy uh, an easy uh, the right decision for us or the easy decision um, a little bit more about the the infra that we that we run as you see it's kind of a really standard uh, architecture which is a we have a load balancer in this case we use two load balancers we use nginx for HTTPS just for that um, we use Barnes for load balancing. We use Barnes as load balancer instead of Nginx because we know pretty well um, Barnes, and he has it has now features like Grace Mode and it's pretty flexible with the load balancing languages language. So we use Barnes. We are used to using that. So that's it. Then we have an API or API servers which are is Python 
with Tornado, with a little bit of C++ for the part with the parts that need really uh, speed or performance. We have the team, uh, and that the API deals with data import, API endpoints, and so on. Then we have Arnis, and you might guess, might, might be wondering why are these guys using two varnishes? It's like we are using one varnish to route the HTTP endpoints from the clients, and then we use another varnish to route, route queries from the API to the database, because Clickhouse has a nice feature, which is they have an, an HTTP interface, and you can query and use any single uh, tool that you use for HTTP routing or any other task. Uh, to, to query Clickhouse. So we put Barneys another time uh, to load balance, to run health checks, and so on. And then we have a cluster of Clickhouse machines that, that store and um, store the data and, we're, uh, um, and the ones that we run uh, queries against. Of course, we run Zookeeper and Redis and many other things to coordinate the stuff, but this is roughly our our architecture. Um, we use higher availability for all the all the every single process that we have. In this case, I just put three. In this case, put, I put three boxes with Clickhouse just to uh, illustrate that we have more more than one replica, of course, in order to uh, be able to serve all the queries that we. Um, that we had during that day, obviously you need to more than one machine. So uh, that's why I put more more boxes. But uh, there are like more than one box for every single piece of that uh, of this architecture. I want to I wanted to remove uh, some noise. So how we did how we deal with the import. Uh, the, with the amount of uh, amounts of, of, of import at the beginning you think okay maybe a Kafka is the good solution for for this because Kafka allows you to send a lot of information and then process that uh, with consumers which is pretty convenient for this use case but you know Clickhouse is really fast you can store one million rows per second easily in a modest machine like my laptop uh, so we so we said, okay, we use Clickhouse, so we use let's use what we have, which is if you send data in batches, which is the which is the case. Just having a landing table in Clickhouse, you can store data as it comes up at a pretty fast pace. So we went with that solution. Um, it's not the case if you have like a lot of events coming from different sources. Clickhouse is not the right solution. Maybe Kafka is the best hit there but uh, for this case we had one or five sec five uh, batches per second is good enough so and what we did is like we generated all the views all the materialized views that that i was commenting earlier based on that landing table so that landing table is our kafka actually um as I said before, we need we needed to run upserts, and Clickhouse is not the best one running real-time upserts. So what we did is like we split the data in two, which is the real-time data and the historic data. The real-time data uh, we run upserts in real time on that time window, and the, for the historic data we just use an append-only table. So splitting that. Uh, that table in two or that that sales table in two was pretty uh, a pretty good solution because uh, 30 minutes data is f you can run up search in real time fast enough um, uh, and of course rows change in a time window of 10 20 minutes so after 30 minutes rows don't change too much so it, it, it's safe to just uh, for a record that is really, really old, that can happen. You, we could receive uh, rows with uh, one hour or two hours delay, which is fine for for you know, for some sales. It, it could happen, but in that case, uh, it worked really well. So real-time data with upsets, real-time upsets, historic table with just append-only data. Um, for each 
a table, for real-time amistoric table, we had two materialized views. Those two materialized views were, uh, were covering 90% of API endpoints. The point here is like a, it's materialized views, materialized view adds uh, a little bit of delay when you import data. So we wanted to keep uh, materialized views number as low as possible. And of course, we wanted that those materialized views to be as simple as possible and as close as possible to the way we, that we were uh, querying the data. So queries were fast. So that's more or less the, the, um, the approach. There are like more small details about the import that I didn't mention. For example, the deal with replication lag. Of course, if you get two queries from the same client that go to different replicas, you might be sending different data and we didn't want to do that because the same client could see uh, different numbers for the same time. So we decided to, I mean, our product actually handles all the handles uh, with the deals with the replication lag pretty well. So you don't have actually replication lag. We use atomic, um, an atomic way to, uh, to, to uh, insert the data. I mean, I'm, going, I'm not going to explain how we do that, but if you have any questions about that, I can, I can answer uh, those. Uh, you send me an email or something like that. Of course, materialized views data must fit in memory because we wanted uh, the queries to be as fast as possible and as stable as possible. Um, and we try to use caching and indexing as much as possible. And when I talk about caching, I'm talking about uh, operating system caching like page cache, page cache and things like that. And indexing, I'm talking about the ClickHouse uh, systems to index uh, data. And they have, I mean, it has a ClickHouse has a pretty nice feature to create spare, spare indexes. And um, if you are, if you model the data. Um, in a good way, uh, you can speed up speed up queries like quite a lot. And for querying, the part of I'm not I'm, I talk about uh, so far I talk about the ingestion part. I didn't talk so much about the about the querying part. So for queries, uh, I it was pretty simple. It's the queries should be as fast as, as possible. I set one objective, which is uh, the uh, uh, percentile 95 should be under 150 milliseconds with just one core, because you can uh, run a query really, really fast with 32 cores, for example. But in this case, I wanted to be as fast as, as, fast as possible one, one, with one core, because we had a lot of uh, concurrent queries. So uh, I wanted uh, one machine to serve as many queries as possible. Um, in order to do that, we materialize data taking into account the call distribution. Not all the endpoints are called uh, with the same uh, frequency and not all of them take the same amount of time. So you need to uh, look at them globally. You can just go. You, you can just go to the endpoint that is going slower and try to optimize that because that maybe that's not the best solution because maybe that endpoint is called once per minute. So if you spend one second or two seconds uh, answering that endpoint, that's not a big problem. But if you have an endpoint that is called 100 times a second, you need to optimize that. So in order to do that, we basically get. Uh, we generate uh, some queries. We get some data from uh, the using introspection in the database, and we take a look at the at the, at the numbers, the, the 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 amount of time that that, that we spend uh, serving those queries. Um, we generate a matrix a matrix like that that told that it tells us where should we put more effort in optimize. For example, in this case, the green are fine. The red are not fine, so we uh, those are filters, uh, rows are endpoints. So uh, if you take a look, we should try to spend trying to optimize the endpoint zero for the, that H non-aggregated um, uh, column or filter. So that's 
the way that we try to do data-driven optimization in in this case, and it worked pretty pretty well. Um, okay, so what happened during the Black Friday? What? No, wait, wait, wait. Oh, so, yeah. Sorry, I skipped one of the one of the uh, one of the slides. So, and this is the way what we uh, in the way that we query the data. If you take a look, uh, we as I said, we have two tables, which is the real-time table and the historic table, and all the all the materialized views that are generated from them. And what we do in order to query the data uh, from those two tables at the same time is pretty easy. We we have a split table with, which tell us from which point we should start use real-time table and which point we should use historic table historic data, uh, which is more or less about now minus 30 minutes. Uh, so this is the more or less the pattern that we use for all the queries, which is get data from historic, get data from RT, from real-time table, and just union that information. Pretty easy, uh, easy to, easy to uh, generate, easy to query, easy to work with, uh, and it's a pattern that works pretty well. And during the Black Friday, Black Friday night, what, what uh, what happened? So we went to the to that night with not so much knowledge, and because you know it's like uh, we had information from the last year, but this year was different because, uh, of course, uh, during this year with the COVID and so on, there was no, uh, you know, the sales went up a lot because online because of course i mean uh, people <laughs> couldn't go to the physical stores so it was really hard to predict what was going to happen um it went well most of the time we ingested 650 billion rows we queried 200 to 12 trillion rows we had a peak of 300 queries per second with a media median of 550 queries per second and the Final time, the percentile 95 was a little bit higher that I was expecting to because I didn't take into account some of the some endpoints that were taking more time. It was not a really big problem, but um, you know it's like four times what I was expecting. So it's not just a 10% or 20%. This is a four times. So my my estimations were not really good in this case. Um, and you know, it's like, if, and we made some mistakes. You know, I, I spent, <laughs> during the Black Friday night, I uh, I had some um, files and some processes running, running running on my machine, so I was changing things locally. And you know, some at some point that we we saw that things were not going uh, well, and basically what was happening is like uh, I was changing things in production, not in my local machine. I made the mistake of having uh, different terminal uh, sessions open. One of them was in the production machine. So during the during the night, I took down the service just because uh, I totally uh, I, I I forgot that it was running things on on production, not in my local machine. But anyway. Apart of that, it worked pretty well, and um, we we use this same architecture for other projects and worked really really well. Um, that's everything. There is a blog post that uh, we wrote like uh, a few months ago, talking about this project with a little bit more detail in some parts and so on. So if you want to read it, um, uh, that is the URL. Um, and of course, you can contact me through um, Twitter or email or whatever. Uh, so you have any questions or something like that, happy, happy to answer. So thank you so much.